Hello there and welcome to another two pint problem coming to you from the Allsop Arms very very close by Baker Street in Sherlock Holmes's place in central London. Just returned from Mobile World Congress uh, a short while ago and it was bigger than ever. Um, last year they moved to the new Fira down the road and this year the overspill went back to the old Fira. It's that big. What do we make of something which continues to grow at this sort of rate? Given the fact that there weren't all that many new mobile phones at the show. It's not just about mobile phones though, is it? I mean, for, for, for your average consumer, the phones are the obvious uh, visible thing. Um, but of course, the show is also about infrastructure, it's also about, about network management, it's about optimization, and it's about new applications of mobile as well. Uh, I mean, the connected car was, was, was quite a big theme. M to M, the Internet of Things, um, and, and, the, and the role of mobile networks in that—that that, that is also a big theme. So, I think you know, it, the, the size of the show really is, is a reflection of the importance of mobile networks in our society, and uh, and the value that they bring to us. Um, in, 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 and you know, frankly, the amount of money we all spend on on uh, <laughs> the, the services they deliver—it's yeah. a, it's a big part of the economy. So, from your point of view, Martin, and from your company's point of view, do you find it a a good investment to spend so much money going to that show? Uh, well, we had a fairly modest presence in that we, we, we didn't have a, an actual booth, we had a couple of meeting rooms, um, but those meeting rooms were booked pretty much solid for the whole four days. Uh, and it's an incredibly efficient way to, to meet with partners, uh, customers, uh, you know, other members of the emerging NFV ecosystem. Um, and you know, rather than getting on a plane and flying off you know, and spending a, you know, half a day on a plane to get a, an hour or two with someone, to be able to have a, a whole procession of those meetings uh, in, at the show. I think that's a, one of the reasons why a lot of people go and one of the reasons it's so popular because there, there are a lot of these meetings you know, between and among the, the, the industry. It's just got total scale, hasn't it? It is huge, and I, I regret that I didn't have enough time to really uh, walk the show floor and, and, and see what was going on. I, I, I did get around to some of the other booths where some of our software was being demonstrated, um, but most of the time I was confined to the meeting rooms. <laughs> like everybody else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is a marathon though, is it not? It's, it is. It's long, long hours, it's tiring. People love it, but like banging your head against a brick wall, it's nice when you stop. But looking back to what it used to be, when, we, when it was in Canon, before that when it was in London, and what it has become, it just shows, as you say, Marty, the importance of network, the network mobile or fixed in our society, and the way in which it's changing. A couple of years ago, there were no cars there. This year, there were dozens of the things. Some little whirly bits on the top, and you know, very, very interesting stuff, and lots and lots and lots of movements away from what we would describe as the traditional mobile handset and so on, into other things. What do you think was the most important thing that was there, Ian? Well, I think that was it. It was, as you say, it's so broad and fast. There was no one thing that I would pick out. There was lots and lots of, of, of announcements within each one of those areas that you talked about. And I suppose what some people are worried about is that because it's become, you know, as you say, right in the middle of our society, everybody's interested in it. The interesting thing is that the newspapers cover it, you know, mm. the BBC covers it. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, and they, and they call it a mobile phone show. They call show. it a mobile phone yeah. show. So, in, you know, the drawback is that maybe the technology, the boring stuff, doesn't go front and centre as much as it maybe sure. it used to. Yeah, because it's, it's really only of interest to, pr to industry professionals. Yes. Um, but, the, I mean, w one thing I would observe, though, is that um, from a sort of technology standpoint, NFV, Network Functions Virtualization, mm. was huge. Oh, publisher. absolutely. Absolutely everybody was... Uh, talking about it, uh, messaging it, uh, and of course there were some quite big announcements around network operators doing stuff in that space. Yes, and well, we had a, one of our clips that actually says, is it, you know, welcome to NFV World Congress. <laughs> 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 yeah. Because yeah. They, that somebody was, made the same observation. Yeah, that mm. was one of the major themes, wasn't it? And I, sp I spent a lot of time talking to people about NFV in particular. And it, the theme seemed to be proof of concepts done hype cycle is coming to an end, it's, the hype is dwindling to some extent, and we're seeing real cases now being brought forward, and real deployments, probably this year, maybe not, but possibly by the end of the year, and certainly by 2015. Mm. 
So, you know, next year's show. And we agreed then, in general, Mobile World Congress is a good thing. I've attended many different kinds of trade shows over the years. Yeah. Uh, and I can remember the days of Interop back in the 90s, which were, you know, and those were huge shows. They were. Um, but we, we do seem to be sort of narrowing down on just a, a small number of really gargantuan shows. I mean, um, CES is obviously another, another mm. huge one. Um, but I, I, I certainly don't see any signs that Mobile World Congress is going to implode or anything. I mean, it, it goes from strength to strength. And it does, absolutely. More power to it. And we still get a week of sleep deprivation and no vegetation. <laughs> and too much tappers. <laughs> Far <laughs> too much. I'm not touching them again. It's at least next February. Uh, moving on then, gentlemen. Ian, you have a clip from an interview that I did actually with uh, Bethany Mayer, who is the Senior VP and General Manager of HP Networking. Let's have a look at that and then pick up on it. I certainly think that NFE is ready for carrier grade. And what's interesting to me is I think uh, I've spent a lot of time talking with carriers today and over the past several months. And uh, as a, uh, I've run the networking business at HP for now three years and so have a lot of carrier customers. And they have to have a change in their mindset as well. So instead of um, basically taking this new concept of virtualization and, and the open standards capabilities we're bringing here and applying some of the old paradigms like NEBS level certification or 6.9's capabilities, instead of, instead of focusing on that, they need to think about how to be very agile. And what they'll see from the over the top providers is um, they actually provide lots of services very rapidly without being bogged down in some of the requirements that are traditionally telco requirements. So, yes, this is carrier grade, but my question to the carriers is, are they sure they need all of the carrier um, paradigm that they've basically been using for many, many years, which frankly has made them very slow to bring services to market and to support their customers. So it's a bit of a, a trade-off for them that they need to think about carefully when coming to this new paradigm of network function virtualization. So then, what Bethany Meyer is saying there is it's all about the need for speed and operators have to differentiate themselves in one way or another. And differentiation has always been on this five or six nines, whatever yes. inflation it is now, of everything. Is that going to change, do you think, listening to what she's saying? How important is that five or six nines for the traditional operator as a differentiator against the OTT players? Uh, well, the, the network operators have used their network reliability as a differentiator against each other. And that's because their services have all been the same. Yeah. I mean, basic voice calls, SMS, you know, it's a completely homogeneous service. So there's no, there's no difference in terms of usability or uh, functionality between those services. So what else do you differentiate on? You differentiate on uh, coverage in the mobile world, um, reliability of calls, uh, voice quality, um, you remember the days of Sprint and the, yes. and the pin drop oh, and yes. all that. Um, now of course um, against an over-the-top service it's a completely different kind of battleground. Um, the over-the-top guys don't claim any of those kinds of quality metrics. What they claim is functionality and a user experience um, that um, that's more appealing and, and, and is differentiated. So, you know, it's, it, instead of homogeneous services that look the same everywhere in the world and are defined by standards but evolve extremely slowly, it's the polar opposite of that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's things that exist completely outside the standards um, where customer experience is king, where quickly evolving in response to feedback uh, is, is the way forward. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very different battleground. Now, the telcos naturally hold on to what they, what they know best. So they, they certainly have a tough time of letting go of the sort of five nines thing. And, and to some extent that's reasonable because um, they are still being judged by those kinds of metrics. I mean, we, we must remember that there are um, consumer survey organizations that, uh, you know, that, that measure, that do surveys, that, that actually do physical measurements. I mean, there, there are companies that get apps out there on people's phones that actually measure the quality of the network, mm. and they publish those rankings. And uh, there was one published last week in the UK, which was um, you know, quite interesting in, yes. the, in, in, its, in its ranking. 
Um, and the, the guys that appear at the bottom, you know, are, are pretty unhappy about yes. it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, th that, that will remain a, a battleground, but it, it, it can't be the only one. And I think, you know, they, they have to find ways of bringing in service innovation as, as, as part of the picture. Well, I suppose the question is, in reality, is the customer experience, rather than these narrow definitions of reliability, um, is, it, is it just as good um, without that rely with those without those explicit measurements. In other words, you know, in cloud and so on, you've got a different way of ensuring reliability, haven't you? Um, using redundancy and so on. It's, but you can't measure it as exactly in, as in, the, in the same granular fashion. But in terms of the customer experience, it may may be as good or even better. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, the the, 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 the traditional way to achieve reliability has always been to um, arguably to over-engineer the network mm. a little bit. So, uh, I mean, in insisting on hardware reliability measures that are demanding and expensive to build for. Um, and, uh, I mean, NEBS compliance, yes. for example, which is the North American... I think Bethany uh, mentioned NEBS. It's he does. One of the yeah. things that, you know, that maybe they have to let go of a little bit. If they're to yeah, I mean, it, 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 it adds very substantially to the, to the cost of the hardware. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing does tend to slow innovation down. So I think, you know, we're moving away from the idea of a central office and you know having to have this super reliable hardware to a world where uh, everything's powered out of a data center and you know it just looks like racks and racks of commodity yeah. servers. I mean that that's working just fine yes. for the over the top guys. Yes. Um, and the fact that an individual physical server may only have three nines availability couldn't matter less if you've engineered the software to be resilient to those kinds of failures. Yes, yes. so you've got even more nines possibly. In terms of user experience, nine nines, nine. ten nines, <laughs> ten nines. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cl cloud is, is a little bit complicated in the sense that there are other modes of failure mm. which perhaps don't exist in a in a, in a yes. traditional network. Yes. Um, so, and and a lot of this comes from you know, everything rides over IP. So the IP transport is absolutely core to this. Yes. Uh, and you know, we all know that from time to time, in a big network, something happens because a software upgrade went wrong or because the you know. A, a, a technician configured a, a router wrong and some fault propagated through the network. So those kinds of things we do have to learn how to tame. Um, but I think if the IP transport is, re is reliable, then there's absolutely no reason why a service can't be delivered with five or even six lines availability out of cloud networks. Tell us about NIBS, because I know that you, you've got a story about <laughs> NIBS. I've never been quite sure what it actually involves. I, I assumed it involved a lot of box ticking and you know making sure these explicit measurements. Oh, there are some. So, so there are some real tests that, that that have to be performed. Some of which are, can can be can seem quite comical. Uh, I mean, th this is a standard that arose from you know, North American uh, network operators, um, really you know placing quite s stringent demands on their hardware manufacturers. And it's things like you know can this can this device survive an earthquake? Um, so, you know, you supply your chassis into a lab, it goes into a rig and it gets shaken uh, quite hard in some cases uh, and it has to just keep working. Um, and then uh, there are requirements around um, uh, fireproof, uh, you know, what happens in the event of a fire. Um, so they, they actually set fire to your hardware. And, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a criterion that says, I think, once the source of ignition has been removed, there shall be no more than a wisp of smoke from the equipment. Define Surely they define wisp very <laughs> well. Define well, it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder, I think, that <laughs> so one, isn't it? Yeah. Gentlemen, we're going to have to call time there. We're at, okay. at the limit of our programme, but thanks very much for the contribution. Ian Scales, and of course, Martin Taylor, as usual, the usual suspects. Thank you. Thank you.